Good morning and welcome to our online sermon here at Lion Lake United Methodist Church. My name is Pastor Joel Fitzgerald. Our scripture lesson today comes from the book of Mark, chapter 13, verses 24 through 37. But in those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, then he will send out the angels and gather the elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. From the fig tree, learn this lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see things, these things taking place, you know that he is near, at the very gate. Truly, I tell you, this generation will not pass away until all things have taken place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But about that day or hour no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Beware, keep alert, for you do not know when the time will come. It is like a man going on a journey, when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight or at the cock crow or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when, you are, when he comes suddenly. And when I say to you, I say to all, keep awake. So the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, this may the words of my mouth, may the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So we're beginning Advent and the season of preparing ourselves for the coming of the Christ child coming into the world. And we have this passage of scripture here from Mark, which seems kind of odd to have in, during the time of Christmas, right? Advent is often a time of carols, a time of buying presents, a time of, of joy. And then we have this passage of scripture that talks a lot about disaster, talks a lot about things in upheaval. And while this might be a little incongruous, I think it's good because it recognizes the reality that as much as we want the season to be all about joy and bells and, you know, cookies and candy, there is some disaster in the world. There is some disaster even in the midst of joyful feeling. We often think about this in terms of those who have lost loved ones. The holidays can be incredibly hard for those who have lost loved ones because during the Christmas season we remember all of those seasons that we had with that person, all of those seasons when when we had them together as one family, as, as one unit, and, and having to go through all of the, the different parts of Christmas, of Christmas Eve, maybe not having that person beside us, of, of having to go through the time of, of opening presents, of gathering together, that can be incredibly difficult. Whether it was someone we lost just days or, or, or this past year, or whether it's been someone we've, we've lost for years, it can be a difficult time. And so in this way, grief is a way in which we sort of have this feeling of disaster, this feeling of disruption, this feeling that things aren't quite right. For some, the, the prospect of, of time at home or time with family isn't as joyful as we would want it to be. Talking with some of the teachers over at Harrington Elementary School where uh, in Elbion, where um, my son Michael goes to school, they say that oftentimes there's a lot of behavioral issues right before the school holiday. And it's not because kids are excited to, to leave school, it's actually the opposite. A lot of kids are going home to home situations that are not that great, to, to family situations that aren't ideal, maybe not even to a home at all. And so the prospect of Christmas vacation is kind of scary. It's kind of troubling for them. So sometimes, even in the midst of the Christmas carols playing on repeat on the radio, we live in times of distress. In the passage of scripture we read, Jesus talks about that. In verse 24 through 25, he says, But in those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will be falling from the heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Jesus here is, is preaching in the context of the temple and, and foretelling, and, and for the people who are reading this, know that uh, the temple complex, the second temple, will be destroyed in, 
in just 30 years after Jesus' death by the Romans. They will come in and they will finally destroy the temple uh, once and for all and, and uh, uh, overcome the, the, the nation of the, the people living in, in Judea. And, and that will be uh, the end of that era of the Jewish people. And so Jesus is preaching in this context where it, it, it seems like things are unsettled. It seems like things are out of sorts. It seems like things are in upheaval in, in preaching in this reality that, that things the way they are might not be the way they are forever. But in the midst of this, in the midst of this reality of disaster, Christ promises restoration. Verse 26 and 28 says these words, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather the elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth and the ends of heaven. So from the fig tree learn this lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So there's this image of God restoring the world to rights, of, of coming in and, and shaking the powers uh, of the nations, shaking them into to, to right action. It notes that even in the midst of this, all things will pass away. It notes that even all things will, will give way to, to God, but the thing that remains is going to be Jesus' words. The things that remain will be the words that Jesus speaks. And so the message is, is not that bad things don't happen. Oftentimes we have such a hard time living in grief, living in, in sadness. We, we live in a world where we, we feel like we shouldn't be sad, where we should just be able to buy our ways out of things, eat our ways out of things, spend our ways out of these hard feelings. And then if we do continue to feel them, that, that must mean something's wrong with us. And Jesus here, I think, is saying, no, it's... It's okay. <clears throat> it's okay to be in this place where bad things happen. But to put that in the context, the cosmic context of what God is doing in the world. Martin Luther King Jr. has this, this famous phrase, the, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. It, it was King's way of contextualizing the work he was doing in the civil rights movement, of noting that there were going to be lots of failures. They were going to make progress, but then there was going to be backlash. And maybe they weren't going to get everything they wanted to achieve, and, and there would still be injustice in the world. And King was trying to point us towards the reality that the universe, the arc of the universe is long, the moral arc, but there is a bent towards justice if it, we believe in the God of the universe. And one of the important things about this, though, is it's not that this will just happen on its own, right? It's not that this will just happen without us doing anything. The reality is we can participate. We can be co-workers with Christ in the restoration from disaster. We can be co-workers with Christ in, in creating the new world and creating the, the new thing that Jesus is doing. Verse 32 and 33, it says these words, but about that day, no one knows the hour, neither the angels in heaven nor the son, but only the father. Beware and keep alert. For you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey. And the man leaves his, his workers and his slaves in charge of his household and, and doesn't tell them when they're coming back. And so the, the workers are, are left perplexed. Well, when is the, the, the master going to come home? And so the admonition is, well, you always need to be prepared. You always need to be prepared, whether it's the middle of the night, whether it's the morning, whether you know, you're preparing breakfast, whatever it is. You need to be ready for the master to come home. It reminds me of a time in elementary school when uh, you know our teacher would, would need to leave and go to the office to do something or make copies or, or get a parent's phone call or, or something and, and would leave the room momentarily. Uh, now keep in mind this was back in the 90s. Things, things happened differently back then. But, but would leave the room unattended. And, and would say, give us firm instructions. Okay, I will be able to hear whatever you are doing. Do not do anything crazy. I will be gone for five minutes. And immediately, the kids get up and start doing things they don't want to do. A couple go by the door and start looking out and seeing if the teacher is going to come back. And in, uh, in most cases, the teacher came back before people were ready and would catch you know, someone up on their desk throwing spit wads at someone else, right? 
that's sort of what it's like to, to, to be prepared for the coming of Christ, to be prepared for the inbreaking of the kingdom of God, to be always looking out the window. And then importantly, doing what we're supposed to do, right? Not throwing spit wads at each other, which as humans is often what we do, but continuing to do the work that Christ set before us. You see, in the midst of disaster, we might have this tendency to wall ourselves off or just to give up, to, to retreat into ourselves, into our own tribes, and, and, and not worry about the world around us. But Christ calls us, even in the midst of disaster, even when we don't know when Christ is going to come back to set things to right, Christ calls us to continue to do that work, to continue to do the work of building the kingdom of God, building the beloved community, doing the work day in and day out, sometimes the thankless work, sometimes the quiet work that no one sees, to create the world that Christ created through the Incarnation. We're called to be watchful, to quietly do the work of building that very thing that Jesus is instituting, building the beloved community that Jesus was talking about and that Jesus gives to us. And Jesus might come tomorrow, Jesus might come in a thousand years, and either way, Jesus calls us to do the same things, to continue that work. So what are some ways in which you can do that? Let me give you a couple options. The first is, uh, coming up this next week uh, is at Marshall United Methodist Church uh, at 7 p.m. is a Blue Christmas service. A Blue Christmas service is a, a service to recognize this very reality, that oftentimes Christmas and the Christmas season can be a time of grief, can be a time of sadness, so this is an opportunity for us to come together in worship and to name that sadness, to name that grief, to name the reality that even though we loved Christmas, even though we love the joy of the season, there are things that we still grieve, there are things that we still lament. So I invite you to, to, to come along to that or to help us with our angel trees or, or, or helping out um, in any of the ways in which we can to create that beloved community. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we give you thanks for the work you do in us, for the work you have done through Jesus Christ, for the message of his coming. Help us continue that work, Christ, we pray. Amen.